We've had such a great time with each other today, and I want to thank everybody that shared. And uh, we've left Darius five minutes to preach today, which is awesome. I got a little gift for Darius. He doesn't need a lot of introduction. We got a UCLA um, bag to put your snacks on. Oh, Darius nice. is a good snacker. Nice. Darius is a good snacker. I'm, I'm cutting back, though. Yeah. Right now, um, our football team isn't real great, but that's okay. You know, you remember the dark days. Yes. It makes, what's that? So it makes the light even that much greater. I think next year, hopefully, we'll beat SMC in football. Right, exactly. So we got, we always need another hat. You always, yeah. need, you always need another hat. And um, Darius is a sweater. You might notice yeah. him. You might sweat a little bit up here today. So we got him, we got him, actually, we got you a new towel. We got you a blue towel. So you can use that one. That's really great. That one in there. And um, so blue and white. And we got you a fan. Oh, yeah. So you got batteries um, in it? We got batteries. Woo, yeah. I bring my own fan too. I, I'm gonna turn on your fan. Yeah. <laughs> I was sitting on that stage last night. <laughs> I'll just stand behind oh, you. Oh, that could work. I'll just stand behind you. That's With awesome. no further introduction, Darius Simmons. Woo! Awesome. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. Oh, this right here. Sorry about that. Amen. So great to be here. This is truly home. You know, uh, in the West is where I grew up spiritually, as, as many have already shared. Yeah, put it on three. Thank you, brother. <laughs> I travel with my fan when I speak. Whew, so hot. Um, but yeah, so I, I grew up in the West. I came down on the mission team. I was a young Christian, just seven and a half months old when I uh, got down here. We got down here the uh, 31st of May, 1989. And uh, I came down from Cal. Uh, I was a freshman there. I had partial scholarships. Obviously, my mom was freaking out. Uh, I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but yeah, I, I came down here, seven months old as a Christian. This is where I grew up. Grew up spiritually. Uh, found my wife here. Uh, graduated from school here. I started my first career. Now, it didn't last long, three years, but still started my first career, career here. So it's really a blessing to be here. So just kind of continuing the theme we've had, uh, one family, one dream. You know, truly, uh, just even to share, it really wasn't even my dream to come down here. Uh, the Cal ministry was about 75 disciples strong. And when we gathered, we had the people from Stanford, we had the people from San Francisco State, San Jose State, whatever. It was about 100 of us. I was very comfortable right where I was. I uh, was only six weeks old spiritually when Tom Brown and Willie Flores came to Cal. I mean, yeah, came to Cal to recruit members to come on the team. And uh, I was like, I'm not going to that meeting. I'm good right here. Uh, but the brother that was discipling me, uh, Ken, uh, sorry, Ken Shaw and, and uh, Harvey Woodford, they said, just pray about it. Consider it. Because, you know, you have family there. I know Reese even mentioned we didn't come here because we have family here. But, you know, that was the, the, way, the pitch they used on me. Pray about it. You got family there. Anyway, God's changed my heart. And so then I was here. And uh, so the point number one, I'm going backwards. One dream, one family. Basically, God's dream became my dream. You know, God's dream became my dream. And uh, first, you don't have to turn there, but in 1 John 2, 6, it says, whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. And that's what I saw in the church. That's what I saw in the San Francisco church. Uh, the towns were leading the church at that time. That's what I saw when we came down here, the 50 of us. We were actually just trying to live out what the Bible says. And uh, God truly blessed that. You know, the biggest, one of the biggest steps of faith was telling my mom. I mean, I have a, for those who know my mom, a very, very strong, domineering mother. Single black mother raised me. Uh, so she already had her concerns about the church. You already, you already know what she thought it was. Uh, so just, you know, after I made a decision to come down here, the next big step of faith was explaining to mom. And I still remember signing the Declaration of Withdrawal. I mean, I was literally a college dropout. I was sharing that last night, talking to, you know, Curtis Conn and different people. I didn't realize that at first. They helped me see. They said, you were a dropout for Jesus. <laughs> You're right. I was a dropout. You know, but when we got down here, uh, I still remember. I, Reese had some of his notes. I don't have notes, but I still remember one of the first devotionals that Tom, Tom Brown did. It was from, you can turn with me there, and uh, just the scripture in Psalm 18 verse 28 
One of the verse, thank you. One of the first devotions that he did was on Psalm 18. And it became, it became one of my favorite psalms, if not my favorite psalm. And in just in verse, eight, uh, verse 28 of Psalm 18, the Bible reads, it says, You, O Lord, keep my lamp burning. My God turns my darkness into light. And what Tom shared with us was that the lamp stood for Los Angeles Missions Planting. And he inspired us. And those of you guys who know who Tom, he's very inspiring. And what he told me, he's, don't worry, God's got your situation in control. So what he encouraged me to do every day, because literally I was a dropout. He said, you know, take a brother with you. There was Ed Wilson, for those of you who remember Ed Wilson. We would go every morning and do a Jericho walk around the admissions office. So literally, we would, he and I would go pray around Murphy Hall. So we got here May 31. June passes, July passes, August passes. My mom is freaking out. You're not in school. What are you going to do? The, obviously, you just don't pray. You go talk inside, and they were saying, hey, best thing you can do, no slights to SMC. My daughter's SMC, great school. Best, best thing you can do is you're, go to SMC for a year and come back when you are a junior. We discourage UC to UC transfers. You know, if you had said you had hardship, death in the family, no problem. But to start a church? Nah. Yeah, basically, they just you know, shooed me away. So it, no problem, because I was believing. I believed that I had the purpose to be here. And just keep praying, keep praying. Now September, though. Now it's six days before school starts. Ed Wilson and I are doing our normal prayer. And after we pray, we always share our faith. We bump into this guy, share our faith. No interest at all in church. But he was interested in us. You know, this kind of an odd couple. You know, Ed Wilson's older. He's a little older. He's a white guy, red hair. Black guy, like, oh, this is an interesting couple. See, he's at, not a couple, couple, but you know what I mean. He's like, hey, what, what's going on? What's your story? So we tell him our story. I tell him my sob story, how I applied to winter quarter, got rejected. Applied to fall quarter, got rejected. Spring quarter, got rejected. I'm just trying to help this church, the community, you know. He says, that's an interesting story. Just come to my office tomorrow. I said, okay, cool. Where's your office? Murphy Hall. Murphy Hall. So now it's five days before school starts. Not only did his name is Michael Coulter, never came to church. Not only did he get me in five days before school started, he restored those partial scholarships I had. He got me in the Dykstra Hall. Totally got. Not only that, he got other people, other college students that moved to LA. Uh, Nicole from San Diego. I was asking Ty, I can't remember her last name, but Nicole they moved up from San Diego. He helped other people get into UCLA totally used by God. And it's just a faith. Obviously, my mom calmed down. She started to visit church. She's not a disciple, but she's like, okay, one year at Cal, three years at UCLA. My allegiance, of course, is UCLA. Okay, we're good. You graduate on time. You're moving on. Okay. But, so she's good. But, uh, but, what, but what I learned from that is faith. God is in control of all things, you know? And you know what? God's, God's dream became my dream, you know? And for many of us, you know, I know that we have ups and downs, as many have shared. My question for you is, what are your dreams now? What are your dreams now? Because there are times, turn with me to, while you're thinking about that, turn with me to, to uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 28. There are times when our dreams kind of fade away. Susan, they kind of alluded to it and really mentioned it. You know, we, we got fired. So we got the situation where I was dropped out, dropped out of college. Now I was without a job. I wasn't homeless. I was about to say homeless without a job. I was without a job. What are you going to do? Again, the family, which I'll refer to later, in the West took care of me. There were three sisters that were working at the middle school where I actually work. You guys may remember them. Lynn Edelstein, Jackie Poulipot, Lorelai Newman. They said, okay, don't worry about the ministry, bro. Just go ahead. You, you'll be a great teacher. We're going to set you up on an interview. You take the CBEST. You'll be a teacher. Sure enough, that's exactly what happened. Those three sisters from our connections from UCLA in the West, uh, with the Marine, boom, set me up the interview, got hired right on the spot. I hadn't even take the CBEST yet. Had to wait for the CBEST, but they hired me right away. I mean, totally God. God is always in control. Look in uh, eight, sorry, Romans 8, 28. Got the timer, you know what I'm saying? So it's all good. I, I'm, uh, forgive me if I'm rushing, just trying to stay on time here. Uh, Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. 
Do you believe this scripture is my question for you? I know you've read it before. Do you believe this scripture? Could someone from the outside looking at your life see the evidence that you believe this scripture? That's the question for all of us today. You know, uh, I, I know that this scripture has not been a deep conviction. It has for most, but there have been times, rather, when it wasn't applied to my life. And what Susan A. mentioned was when, one of those times. In 1995, when, uh, you know, with, without all going into all the details, that you know we're out of a job. We thought things were going great. <laughs> I mean, we were leading the ASU campus. Uh, souls were being saved. We were having fun. We're like, hey, what's going on? Next thing you know, that we're, we're on our way back to L.A. and we're out of the ministry. That was one of those times for us to really see, do we believe this scripture? Because this dream, I thought that I was going to lead half the church and the Todd, I mean the world, and then Todd would lead the other half. <laughs> well, that's gone. So where are you when you get hit, when you get knocked down? This scripture still applies, though. You know what helped me in that situation during that time was a book that Kip gave me a long time ago that many of you guys probably have read, Trusting God Even When Life Hurts by Jerry Bridges. You know, Kip gave this to me years ago. I'll just read the little forward. He had read it before. He gave this back to me in 91. So I had read it then. I read it again, obviously, when we came out of the ministry because I was really struggling um, with my faith. And, you know, just reading the forward is really inspiring. It says, in God we sometimes, in parentheses, in God we sometimes trust. Do you find it easy to trust God until adversity strikes? When life clouds over you? Do you suddenly begin to second guess your faith and suspect that only, only imagine his care for you? In trusting God, Jerry Bridges uncovers three essential truths about God. Truths we must believe if we are to trust him in adversity. They are one, God is, in completely, God is completely sovereign. God is infinite in wisdom. God is perfect in love. In order to trust God, writes Bridges, we must always view our adverse circumstances through the eyes of faith not since when we seek him in the midst of personal pain and discover him to be trustworthy, we'll find ourselves in a deeper, more intimate relationship with him as a result. We are not at the mercy of our circumstances. Think about that. Pat shared powerfully about that. We are not at the mercy of our circumstances. Although God's ways of working in our lives are frequently beyond explanation, we must learn to trust him, even when we don't understand. You know, uh, amen. Uh, that is what it's all about. When, when you're in a challenging situation, what do you do? Are you turning to God? Are you turning in prayer? Are you, you, do you have people in your life? Are you involved in other people's lives? You know, that's where you... That's how you're able to keep that dream or find a new dream. A new dream that we got was just, hey, let's work in a regular full-time job and lead a ministry. And sure enough, that's what God's doing now. We lead a, what's called the L.A. City Ministry in the metro region. Uh, we've got about 40 disciples. You know, it's awesome. It's tr truly awesome. Uh, and we have a regular job, so we're good. So we don't have to worry about anything like that. And that's, hey, that's God. Um, but, you know, where are you this morning? Have you allowed your dreams to just fade away. And if so, why? Because God is not done with you. God, like you said in Romans 8, 28, has a purpose for you right now. And it's up to us to find that purpose. Amen. We'll move on. I had other things to say, but all this awesome sharing, that's awesome. We'll move to family. Amen. It's all good. Nothing but love. Nothing but love. Amen. So now point number two, which was one, one family, one dream. I did them backwards. God's family became my family. Amen? And look over with me to uh, Galatians chapter 6. God's family became my family. And even before, amen, I'm right here. Even before we read that, I want to ask you, what makes a healthy family? I'll take responses. Remember, I'm a teacher, so I, I, I don't mind responses. What makes a healthy, healthy family? I'll take some responses right now. Communication, absolutely. Love. Trust. Okay, one at a time now. I'm as soon as raise your hand. Okay, go, try, 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 try. All right, you guys got the you got the gist of it. I read I read this article. I read this article 
by a lot, uh, some people who are a lot smarter than me, okay, they have lots of degrees, and, and the title was uh, Research on Successful Families, and the ten, sorry, nine things that they mentioned were communication, encouragement of individuals, expressing appreciation, commitment to family, religious spiritual orientation, social connectedness, ability to, to adapt, clear roles, time together. And there are lots of different things in this article. I'll just couple, uh, hit a couple of them. I'll talk about the adversity. Just a little while ago, our family in Metro LA, we had one of our, our ministers for a long, long time, you know, leave and take like 40 plus people. That was obviously, and still is, that's an adverse time. And the question is, what do you do in those situations? And how are you spiritually? It's a test from God. God's in control. He always is and always will be. But how do you deal with it once everything settles and those people are gone? And what this little article was even saying, just another uh, one of those characters of a strong family, it says that it's they are able, strong families are those that are, have the ability to absorb stress and cope. And that's exactly what it's all about, what, what we're fa facing. You know, we're going through a challenge situation, and what's saving us? The Word of God, one another, prayer, repeat, one another, prayer, talking, openness. You know, and the article goes on, obviously not time for that right now, but the point is, we're family. And Susan and I are coming up on, well, 31 years for me in October, October 9th, I became a Christian, October 9th, 1988, 32 for her in November, and we've been in a lot of different ministries. What we, what we have seen is ministries that are strong have a sense of family. So my question is real simple as we start to wind down, are you building family in your ministry, in your small group, in your overall ministry? I thought what we did at Communion was fantastic. Turn around and sharing. We share with the keys, old friends from the cross and switchblade, just sharing our hearts about what communion means to you. Wow, that's powerful. It's a powerful tool. But beyond that, I mean, are you building family in your group? Again, if someone's looking from the outside, would they see that love like it says in John, in John 15? Would they see that family? You know, in our group, that's what we're doing. You know, you know well, I'll first reflect back on UCLA. Let me get those notes. Um, that's what we had at UCLA. All the time, we were together. And I wrote down some of the things we used to do that, you know, were awesome. I mean, there were crazy things, too. I didn't mention those. You know, keep it. All right, playing basketball all the time, studying for classes, sharing our faith, going to the Man Theater when a new movie came out, together, hanging out at the student union, going to eat Dieterese ice cream and cookies. It's still there. We'll drive up from South LA to go to Dieterese just for some cookies and ice cream. Uh, eating at Headlines. It was a little diner. I'm not sure if it's still there. Uh, eating at Saks. Hey, we did a lot of eating. Okay, well, I'm cutting down. I'm doing okay. But well, anyways, after service, we would go to this place called Saks. I believe it was called Saks, Japanese um, restaurant, teriyaki. Uh, Marty and Chris. Okay, sorry. That's my timer. My bad. Uh, Maybe one more minute. Maybe one, 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 two. Okay. All right. Anyways, I'll wrap it up. I'll wrap it up. All right. Todd said I had 17. I set the alarm for 15. All right. Here we go. Playing dunk ball at Fairburn Elementary. Larry was always dunking on this little short guy dunking on us. Uh, you had to struggle with your attitude. Work through that. Anyways, because uh, he can dunk. He can dunk a regulation. Anyways, uh, studying the Bible with people. Um, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. I mean, that's what made that ministry strong. You know, are you building that in your ministry now? You know, I'll, I'll close out by sharing our ministry now. I mean, we, we have great people in our ministry led by the Kianas. Um, they're awesome. They combine the groups. And uh, one of the couples in our group, Bruce and Tracy Evans, that came from Colorado years ago, they planned the amazing trip to Big Bear this past long weekend. Much like what Pat was sharing, they were in the Rockies. We were up in Big Bear. And the same type of things. Families, do I look like a camper? <laughs> if you didn't know, the answer is no. But we were in a four-man tent, Susan A, Zara, and I. And a little side note, four means two. Eight means four. We're all squashed in this. We got the air mattress. We're freezing. It's 47 degrees. I run hot. And I was freezing. Why? What are we doing here? Because of family. That's why we were there. We were there because we love each other. We had a blast. We had five-star meals. I mean, Bruce was grilling salmon on this, like, flat top thing, uh, steak. We had another brother, Freddie Baker, was a deep-frying red snapper that he caught in Mexico. 
shrimp, crab legs, smothered, rice, fries, fruit, and that was just one meal. We were kayaking, great times of prayer up in the mountains, right by Big Bear Lake, devotionals every night, each brother led one, um, deep talks, talks with people you don't normally uh, talk with, with whom you don't normally talk, hiking, water fun, uh, this jungle floating thing, the teens were just jumping off it, going crazy, jumping on trampoline. Uh, of course, I'll, I'll hit with the last one, there's a few more, but hit visiting the North Pole fudge ice cream, I love that place, English toffee ice cream. Anyways, here's the point. <laughs> we had a blast. I don't normally, I don't ever camp. But we did, and we'll be back next year. We just won't be in a tent. We'll be in the RV like the Nelsons, Eric and Tiffany, and the Kianas, or that little village of RVs to the side by the kayaks. We won't be in the tent, but we'll be there because of family. It was awesome. So, you know, there's more we could say, obviously. Uh, bottom line is this, guys. One family, one dream, and God, to God be the glory. Amen? Amen. <laughs> You're looking good. You're looking good. Thanks, brother. Hey, man. Hey, man. I love this. <laughs> Great time being together today. Larry, we used to go to Fairbird after who? After after church and play ball. We're not going to do that today. And we used to eat all the D.D. Reese we could. Now we have to count calories. <laughs> Just getting older, that's all. Uh, we